Thank you. Um, yeah, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Angela and I'm going to be leading the discussion in this evening's session, which is really about the importance of the ocean and climate. And by leading, I mean, I'm going to ask the difficult questions to a panel of experts who know a lot more about it than I am, so I get the easy job. Um, I will have a few questions on my own to start things going, but please add questions for the chat box function, chat box function uh, in Zoom, and I'll try to ask as many of those as possible. Uh, if you can keep them short and clear and be a little bit patient with me, because I'll be trying to read them while also interacting with the, the panel. Um, this session will run to about six o'clock, and then when the session finishes, uh, we're going to move uh, into a breakout room where we will continue to answer your questions if you're interested. And so at that point, uh, if you could move across to the, the spectator, spectator's lounge and the speaker's lounge, and then you can actually go to the speaker's lounge and we, we can carry on answering your questions. Thank you. But firstly, I'd quite like to introduce the panel. Um, I have the privilege of introducing four excellent scientists. Um, maybe you could wave when I actually introduce you. So the first person is John Hufflands. Uh, he has a first degree in mathematics with physics. Uh, his research has been about the dynamics of shelf seas. Um, for example, how and why shallow waters around the UK move and connect with the deeper ocean beyond. Uh, secondly is Zoe Jacobs. Uh, she's an early career researcher uh, whose research links the climate, oceans and fisheries. And in particular, she's interested in understanding the impacts of future climate change. Merrick Shrokoff started his career uh, as a researcher investigating the energy from the alternative energy sources from the ocean and thinking about wave power. Uh, and this was in the 1970s. You don't look like that. <laughs> you look much younger. Very kind. <laughs> uh, and now he works on the role of oceans and climate. And finally, Eleanor Franca Williams is a physical oceanographer and climate scientist who use, uses observations to investigate the ocean dynamics and circulation in the changing climate. Um, I kind of just wanted to start setting a tiny bit of scene and then go straight into questions to you guys as the experts. So we know now that the oceans play a key role in climate. Um, they've taken up about 93% of excess heat and about 30% of the excess anthropogenic carbon that's been generated. And this has changed the ocean in, in physically and chemically and changing those properties and, and it has profound implications. Uh, increased warming and marine heat waves do exert extreme pressures on marine ecosystems from coral reefs to polar ecosystems. And this is making a huge difference now, but we know that the oceans have always played a part in the Earth's climate. So I suppose I wanted to start by just maybe Eleanor, if I could ask you, you know, in what ways do the ocean influence, does the ocean influence climate? Yeah, absolutely. So, so as you said, the oceans are taking up heat, which for the oceans means that uh, they're picking up heat at the equatorial regions, and which is where we get most of the sunlight. And then they move that heat to the polar regions. So they're actually actively involved in redistributing where the heat is on, on, the, on the planet. And they cover 70% of the Earth's surface. So, so this is a large area of the Earth's surface that's involved. And then as they're moving that heat around, they're changing the temperature patterns of sea surface temperature and what we call ocean heat content, and that then influences the atmosphere as well. So you can have the ocean moving heat around, and then those patterns of the heat at the ocean surface can influence the weather and the climate that we experience, changing the uh, storminess that we feel or, um, or even heat waves that we have over land areas. Uh, that's, that's just, I mean, I could go on and on about many different ways that the oceans influence climate, but that's one of the big ones. That's great. Um, actually, I might come to John and say, John, is this kind of the reason why, you know, you get tropical plants in places like in the Yew Gardens in the north of Scotland, or is, is that different? And, and how might that change if that's the case? You're muted. I think I'm muted. That's half the story. Um, the, the, uh, the, the reason for tropical plants in funny places around the UK is partly because shelters have been made, natural shelters in some places like behind the hills, but in the case of the northwest Scotland, because the gardeners deliberately planted banks of trees to provide shelter. But the other thing is that the winds, prevailing winds in the UK are from the west or southwest, especially in winter, and that means they're coming from the sea. Uh, and at least uh, further away from the UK, the sea is relatively warm as the Gulf Stream and its extensions uh, come across the North Atlantic. 
um, not not right against the UK, and the warm air warmed air is an essential factor. Um, but of course, as the air travels uh, further to the east, it's um, losing its heat to the to the land and the sea, uh, the, the colder seas east of the UK, for example. Um, but the, 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 another factor which I might have added to what's been said before is that um, the top three or three and a half meters of the sea hold as much heat as the whole atmosphere. And that's why the sea is such an important factor in regulating the climate. So, uh, so it's a really important way in which uh, buffer almost to the temperature on the planet. But, um, and you, meant, you both mentioned the kind of ocean circulation. Um, how is this currently changing? Um, you know, is there a point we should worry? Um, maybe Merrick or John can answer that one. Okay, um, so I'll, if I take that one. Um, so we know that uh, we're melting bits of Greenland and uh, there's more rainfall because the atmosphere is warmer. So that's changing the amount of fresh water that's going into the ocean. And that can affect the current systems, particularly in the North Atlantic, which is uh, very sensitive to some of these things. Um, because the uh, currents are dependent on the temperature and the saltiness of the water. So if you add fresh water, you can disrupt the currents. And that's part of what we're doing in observing what's known as the overturning circulation in the North Atlantic, which brings heat northwards and could be disrupted by some of these changes. And if that happens, less heat coming northward would mean Northwest Europe could get cooler. Uh, uh, paradoxically, in a warming world, you could cool locally. Of course, the heat doesn't go away. It just means somewhere else on the planet gets even hotter. It just means that locally we may get a cooler uh, temperatures for a while, at least. So that's that interesting balance between what's a global change and what's kind of regional patterns. Um, yeah. You, you kind of mentioned the Arctic. What about, you know, a lot of people worry about things like polar bears becoming endangered. I mean, uh, if this change is happening, you know, could it be either that we get cooler or warmer in those regions, but we're, we're still working to predict that, or do we know what's going to happen? Um, do you want me to answer that? <laughs> Uh, I'll let you answer that and then I'll open up to a few others okay. if you want to. So with regard to the Arctic, we know the Arctic is warming and we know from satellite observations that um, in the summer, the Arctic sea ice has been shrinking. So the summer extent of sea ice is much smaller now than it was, say, 30 or 40 years ago. We've got satellite measurements which show that. And of course, um, the models that we have of the Arctic warming suggest that, well, originally we thought by the middle of this century, summer uh, sea ice might have disappeared. But some of the more recent results suggest that it might have disappeared some of the sea ice might disappear by 2035. And obviously that is a problem for polar bears that hunt off the sea ice. No sea ice, nowhere to hunt. So that could impact the uh, ecology of the Arctic quite seriously. Thank you. Um, and obviously there's gonna be huge implications for a lot of the biology in the ocean, but there's also huge implications for people. Uh, Zoe, I was just wondering uh, from your perspective, you know, you, you have an interest in fisheries, uh, but also in coastal communities. I mean, how is this really gonna affect people in coastal communities and particularly those rely on this as a livelihood. Yeah, so it's going to be, it's going to cause some huge problems, I think, over the coming decades um, from various sources, though. So um, there's an increased uh, risk of flooding from sea level rise um, and also from storm surges with the extra um, amount of energy that's available, leading to uh, an increased frequency and intensity of strong so uh, storms or cyclones. Um, so combining that with the destruction of things like mangroves and kelp forests, which are natural barriers to these kind of surges and flooding, um, because it could cause considerable damage and eventually um, cause people to have to relocate. Um, so that's one particular impact. Um, another one you mentioned uh, for fisheries, which is uh, my kind of line of work. So um, there's an expected decline in productivity in the oceans um, and that will mean there's less food available and consequently fewer fish available for the fishermen to catch um, and this is this is especially important in uh, some coastal communities who are reliant on fish for food security both directly so uh, by con consuming them uh, themselves um, which is an important protein component of their diet um, or indirectly by uh, selling it at markets and making a living so if the fish catch drops substantially, it could lead to food and insecurity and really affect the livelihoods of millions of people um, around the world. And again, as we've mentioned, it will be regionally variable. So we need lots of monitoring uh, to hopefully get early warning systems in place um, to, to provide adaptation measures to manage it um, effectively. Yeah, I mean, I hear that um, I think uh, marine sources are a kind of source of protein, primary source of protein for about a billion people. And I think probably 30% of the protein for 
30% of the population on Earth. I mean, it's a really important area. Um, so uh, is there a balance between climate change and other impacts in that space? I mean, do we have to consider, um, you know, obviously in coastal communities, often they're managing their fisheries in a very sensible way, but it, is there a way in which we need to think about the bigger picture in terms of the combined things of pollution fisheries in an, int an intensified way? Um, or is climate the big one? Oof. I mean, I think everything needs to be managed in a kind of balanced way. Um, as a, a, you raised a kind of an important point about coastal communities, the, the, fishery, the fisheries there is mostly artisanal. So they are small scale. Um, and those things uh, tend to be managed a lot in, well, in a completely different way to the kind of large scale um, industrialized fisheries. Um, and obviously those industrial um, in, uh, there's industrial fisheries use that use the huge boats probably emitting a lot more carbon into the atmosphere so you've also got those kind of things to manage as well alongside sustainably managing the fisheries protecting the climate as well there's lots of things to consider so everything does need to be managed kind of in a balanced way and, and actually coming back to Eleanor I mean you, uh, in terms of this change in terms of the climate and the way in which the oceans are moving um, does that have implication for the biology for fisheries? Will they move places? Will they, yeah, will they yeah. change or lose them? It's it's not something that I have expertise in, but I have I have um, encountered some some evidence or some some papers that I've read saying that as you have climate warming and you have warmer waters, perhaps from the Atlantic, moving up further north than they normally do, that you can actually have different species of fish in places that um, wouldn't wouldn't have been there say 50 years ago so so as the oceans are redistributing just the temperature and salinity in the water it's also changing the conditions for the for the um for the life there i see zoe's raised her hand so she might have a better answer on this <laughs> yeah absolutely zoe hi i just yeah i just wanted to add to that because i was just actually reading something quite interesting the other day about um how climate changes can cause um changes to our ocean currents which we've discussed already um, and those uh, currents can actually change the connectivity of certain regions, which is quite important. So um, it can cause species to suddenly appear in regions that they've never appeared before, and that can upset the balance quite dramatically. So there's quite a good example. Um, the, uh, I think it's the East African coastal current um, has shifted in position by about 350 kilometers. Um, and it's basically caused the appearance of these sea urchins um, uh, in the south of Australia, which is completely disrupting the kelp forests. Um, so things like that need to be monitored as well. Yeah, oh, that changing uh, population can have knock-on effects on the rest of the population. Uh, so John, I mean, you, you've you got a, a very strong track record in thinking about how we inter have the interplay between the shelf seas and the open ocean. So is this particularly important in terms of the way in which people and the land interacts with, with the global system? Well, uh, what I was going to say is that a, another effect uh, not yet mentioned is with sea level rise, then salt water can potentially get further inland and that could affect uh, agriculture in coastal regions. And also, uh, with regard to species movement, this is being seen around the UK has been some northward migration of uh, plankton uh, Zooplank copepods and and um, actually of course we one of the reasons why we don't fish for cod as much as we used to is that the cod have moved northwards yeah uh, that, rather that's, changing, that. that's changing the base of the food chain in the way that you know we rely on grass and trees to for animals then the kind of phytoplankton the plants of the ocean so when you start changing the food supply for the rest of the the animals they, there's going to be a massive implication so going back to your your question, um, the um, uh, some future climate scenarios suggest that uh, changed conditions in the Atlantic off the North Sea may much reduce the circulation within the North Sea, which could be quite serious for um, pollutant buildup or transport of other materials in the North Sea as well. I suppose we're seeing something like that off Turkey at the moment. <laughs> so. Uh... <laughs> so uh, thank you. Um, actually, I'm going to change tack a bit. And actually, we hear an awful lot about uh, commitment now to net zero, which is which is brilliant if you think about it. And so I want to kind of just think about how we can make a difference in that way. Um, Merrick, you know, you, your background you come from, how do you get energy from the ocean and how can you really use it as part of a kind of clean energy supply? 
Well, there are, there are several sources of energy that you can get from the ocean. There are four main uh, ones, one of which I'm not very uh, very up on because I never never had much to do with it. That's the ocean thermal energy conversion, where you use the temperature gradient between the warm water at the surface and the cold water at the bottom to uh, generate ele electricity. I've never quite got to grips with how that works. I've not worked on it. But uh, the other three areas are um, using tidal flow or current flows. So you you just put a turbine in the water and the flow through the turbine generates electricity. Uh, you can either do that by sort of like freestanding turbines just on the bottom, or you can build something like the Bristol Barrage. When I was a PhD student in Bristol, which is a long time ago now, they were talking about building the Bristol Barrage across the Severn Estuary. And then you let the water pile up behind the barrage and then let it out when you need the energy. Of course, that has huge ecological implications. It's never been built. Um, but it's another way of doing the tidal energy. And the same with currents. If you've got strong currents, then you could put a turbine in the current, you could generate energy. My own research was on wave power. Basically, if you stick something on the surface and it moves in response to the waves, if you can uh, make use of that motion to generate energy, say you have two things hinged together and put a generator in between them so as it flexes, you can generate power. So there's lots of possibilities of getting clean energy. Um, and for somewhere like the UK, which is obviously an island, which we've got lots of opportunity to to do that. Um, the problem is it's expensive to set up in the first place. But of course, if we want to tackle some of these problems, maybe we have to pay the cost of doing it. Um, so, in yeah. some ways, it's the kind of invest to save and that you yeah. invest in that initially. Um, yeah. But actually, the more people take it up, the cheaper it becomes. So yeah. um, that's really interesting. And and. Um, Obviously, the ocean also is a site for um, offshore wind farms and other applications, and we're seeing a real drive from uh, oil and gas to, to renewables now. Uh, do you feel that there is a real potential for us to, to quite quickly transition further um, in this way and reduce our you know, use of fossil fuels um, over the next few years? Well, I, th I think it's one component. Um, I'm not sure we can be entirely dependent on things like wave power and wind power, because obviously, with weather patterns and so on they're not always there when you want them so i think we need to invest also in some storage methods so that we can store energy and i think that's a, a big area of research at the moment um, i think that's an important area for the future because we want to be able to store the energy as well and use it when we need it and we've got some methods of doing that now but they're fairly small scale and i'm not sure we really tackle that problem i also think that um there's lots of efforts to cut our energy usage which obviously would help so I think there's, it's not one thing. There are several things you need to do, of which alternative energy is one, one yeah. key aspect, but it's not the only thing that we need to do. Yeah. And actually, weirdly, when we actually cut our energy use, we save money ourselves, if, if yeah. that makes sense. So, the, so again, it's that invest to save kind of concept. Yeah. Um, I might maybe bring in Zoe here, uh, uh, maybe off the wall question, but I hear a bit about blue carbon. So maybe thinking about natural uptake of carbon. Um, is that something particularly important in the coastal environment? And is that all, is that possible throughout the world or is there just certain regions for that? Yeah, um, blue carbon is kind of an up and coming kind of interest. Um, so they are basically just carbon sinks. So things like uh, mangroves, seagrass, uh, salt marshes, kelp forests, all those kind of natural coastal ecosystems, um, they can remove the carbon from the atmosphere and store it uh, mostly below ground reducing the amount that we have in the atmosphere and it only gets released if, if everything kind of gets destroyed. So um, it's important that these natural resources are protected and restored. Um, and as well as storing carbon, they'll also provide habitats for various species like nursery grounds, um, protecting lots of different species, hopefully, um, and also act as a barrier for storm surges and flooding as well. So I think it's incredibly important that they are protected, those that are already there, um, and I'm sure there are projects um, looking at trying to restore ones that have been damaged. Um, so it would be coastal, coastal kind of communities that, that could that could benefit the most. So by controlling um, or managing our environment in a sustainable way, we actually get the protection from the ocean as well, which is you know in itself being stormy and tricky. But we also get the benefit of actually having income and and food sources, which if we do it sensibly, can balance quite nicely. But if we're not thinking about it, it could lead to repercussions which is what we worry about nowadays exactly. uh, thank you um i might actually come to eleanor again but i'm going to maybe put this to all of you if you have any extra questions which is we've kind of talked about some of the big picture stuff but at home what can people actually do what can what can the individual at home do to make a difference uh, to help 
with the health of the ocean in general or to actually think about climate change. So I'll maybe come to Eleanor first and then we can see if anyone wants to add any other thoughts, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, so um, one of the things that I think could make a big difference is just using your own use of fossil fuels a little bit less. So if you have the opportunity, you can walk to school, walk to work, bike to work, and instead of getting in the car to go a short distance, just leave that to the side. And then, of course, we haven't talked about it much here, but um, plastic pollution is also a big problem in the oceans. And so reducing your use of plastic in the first place, as well as recycling the plastic that's possible to be recycled, is, is uh, an easy step that is um, something we can all do. Thank you. Um, maybe uh, Merrick can I come to you next if you have any extra thoughts. I would have probably said exactly the same as Eleanor. Um, I think, you know, cutting cutting um, your travel. So, I mean, I, one of the questions I have from, for myself as a scientist, um, not so much over the last year because of COVID, but in the past, I've done quite a lot of international travel. My job requires me to go into international conferences, flying long distances by air. And I do sometimes wonder whether, you know, uh, as scientists, we should be cutting our own travel to set a good example um to others because you know we're saying the climate is changing if we fly do long haul flights we we put a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere so i've been trying to reduce myself to one international conference a year rather than several as i used to do when i was younger so um i think there's things like that as scientists we need to think about and not just things at home but obviously if in, in in terms of holidays where are you going on holiday and can you get there without flying um it's a good thing so, uh, so absolutely. So the flying component is really important. Travel, uh, the way we insulate our homes, um, the food we eat. So I suppose in some ways um, we can help the big stuff by doing the small stuff every day. You know, the decisions you make can make a big difference if all of us make good decisions. And so it's not about not doing things. It's about doing things only because you need to or planning what you're doing and what the implications. And, and even with net zero, it's partly about do we need to generate that carbon? And if we do, can we deal with the carbon we've generated in a way? So it's it's that kind of uh, circular economy you hear it called sometimes as well yeah. as that kind of really thinking about it and uh, and it's a decision you make each day that's the kind of difference you can make is that that's sort of what i'm hearing um so the one of the other things i hear is that um uh, obviously fisheries or fish from or seafood um are a kind of low carbon alternative so obviously farming for cows and pigs etc is quite highly intensive in terms of the way in which it's done and the amount of implication it has on land and in the atmosphere. Um, is that something to think about, about your food supplies and where you get them from? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think if we all make, as you were saying, small changes, then collectively it can kind of come together because everyone always says, oh, what's, what's the point if I do it on my own? But if we all make the small changes, hopefully then together it should make a huge change. So, yeah, thinking about your diet is something that a lot of people don't actually consider to be important in the climate kind of crisis um, and that's one thing I would say actually in terms of what can we do is you can do all these little things yourself which is which is brilliant but also maybe encourage others to do the same promote awareness of these issues because um, a lot of them aren't um, aren't kind of publicized as well like like changing your diet for example yeah so I hear a lot about the oceans being out of sight, out of mind. We see a bit of the ocean, but we don't really appreciate the beauty and vastness and what's there. Um, and actually, if we can communicate with other people about how important the oceans are, how we can protect them and also them be an important way support for living, for food, for, for people and coastal communities, then actually, you know, it's a we can make a big difference just by educating people. And by that, I mean, not doing a not not doing a big campaign to educate I mean just talking to each other about it celebrating what's there that sounds like a, a really good way forward um I kind of would like I'm going to come to John again actually I'm quite curious because obviously that passion for oceanography I, I kind of wanted to come towards the end to what made you guys actually want to do this so John can I start with you I mean you know is there is the feeling of making a difference what attracted you to it and why have you stayed in it so long and done such a great amount of work in it you know what kept you going well, in, in some way, I think you could say I sort of fell into it, but um, um, I um, was uh, enjoyed uh, mathematics at school. I also enjoyed geography at school. Um, and uh, but then I did a maths degree, as you, as you said, but then I went on to do a PhD in a department which did oceanography. 
So in that sense, I sort of fell into it. But I was always interested in fluid dynamics. When, when I was very young, um, we, we had um, a veranda beside the house and the water used to trickle, when it rained hard, the water used to trickle through this uh, veranda from the back garden to the front. Uh, and that somehow fascinated me. So uh, fluid flow was always something uh, <laughs> that um, caught my attention. But as I say, in the end, it was sort of a matter of, matter of chance. And I think to some extent, one's career is always going to be a matter of chance. Uh, someone earlier today was saying, take your opportunities. Um, and I think uh, that's it. Go, go with something that you enjoy and that you're good at. Yeah, absolutely. Really good advice. Um, maybe I'll come to Eleanor. How about yourself? Well, mine's, mine's kind of similar, actually. So I also did a degree in math, but I decided I thought math for its own sake was boring. <laughs> and I loved the outdoors <laughs> and the environment. Yeah, yeah. And so I, 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 um, I started looking into engineering fields and ways to get bring the environment and math and physics together. And uh, I didn't know at until sort of halfway through my first degree that oceanography even existed. Um, but about that time, I, I discovered oceanography and I had an opportunity to go out on one of the big research vessels and participate in field work and I was hooked. So I've yeah. been doing that ever since. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Merrick? Oh, well, it's all very familiar, this. I also did a maths <laughs> degree. Uh, and then I then I went in on did a PhD on wave power, so that was fairly theoretical in terms of waves. And then I had to get a job, um, and the job I found that uh, interested me was at the Institute of Oceanographic Sciences, working on waves. So I sort of transitioned to doing more on waves, and then plankton-like, I've sort of drifted into other areas of oceanography since. So I've been involved <laughs> in satellite oceanography, uh, oceans rolling climate. Uh, lots of other aspects of oceanography so I didn't sort of plan my career but I've had a fun career I've really enjoyed it um, going to sea with colleagues um, but also uh, doing things like looking at the oceans from space and working with people like the European Space Agency and NASA has also been very interesting. So I'm hearing a lot about uh, kind of finding things you love doing things you feel you, you're good at and uh, and actually just once you got into it there was so many opportunities and excitements that you just kept going so I'm going to come to Zoe as maybe the person who's in the early career phase. Um, so, you know, what brought you into it and what do you hope will, will be the future? Um, OK, well, I'm going to buck the trend and I didn't do a maths degree. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I started actually doing geography. Um, I, I was always into the sciences and maths, but I just found it so interesting. Um, all the different ways you can apply the science. Um, and then I did meteorology, so weather and climate, and then finally the PhD um, in oceanography. Um, and I've always I've always loved the ocean so it was kind of an easy thing to slot into and like Eleanor it didn't I didn't know it existed really as a kind of thing to study obviously now I think about it obviously but um it was kind of new to me at the time um yeah I've always loved the ocean um so I've always wanted to understand it and then more importantly help protect it um there's still so much to learn there's that phrase um we know more about the surface of Mars than we do the ocean yeah. floor and that's yeah. quite inviting to me to try and learn more. And then hopefully um, I'm, well, I'm now well placed to try and make a difference in some way. Yeah, so I, um, I always thought I was a biologist. <laughs> so I definitely didn't do the physics side or the maths. Um, uh, and I do believe I get more excitement from doing maths with purpose, which is where you actually yeah. coming from a biology point of view sometimes. Uh, and so, but actually that unexplored thing, I mean, that I, I'm trying to remember the facts off the top of my head, but I. Uh, I think there's something like 90% of the biology in the ocean is yet to be fully ca categorized and described. So we have so many things we don't know, including because, of course, down to the really small bits, which I think are incredibly exciting and beautiful that most people don't even see. But uh, yeah, that, that un un unknown exploration component. Um, what I'm hearing is it's kind of sad we, we don't really get it out to schools well enough. One of the things that's changed recently is a lot of people are doing psychology degrees because there's an A-level in psychology. And so they learn it's really interesting and they get a real feel for it. You know, we need to think about how we engage in schools in a way that, you know, teaches kids to understand and appreciate the ocean, but be excited by it. And if we can do that, I think we can make a real difference. Um, I personally wasn't going to be a marine person at all. And if you told me I'd end up as a director of science and technology in a marine organization, I probably would have laughed because I started off as a pure biologist. But uh, I also ended up getting on a research cruise, which happened to go to the equatorial Pacific, which 
by the time you've done that and experienced the world, you get really hooked into it, not because of the, the world of being on a ship, uh, on a ship, but just being in the ocean just puts things in perspective. When you're in the middle of an ocean and the world is vast and huge and you can see the horizon all around and you realize how small and insignificant you are, you suddenly appreciate that ocean in a way that it's hard for other people to do, I think. And I think that's, uh, I really appreciate that I got the opportunity to do that. Um, we're actually coming to the end of our time. So I just wondered, I just kind of leave it open. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to kind of highlight to the audience right now? Um, and if not, uh, we will move into the other room and we can um, take questions. I'll make sure I get it right this time, which is the speaker's lounge uh, and we can answer some questions, uh, but we'll be typing the answers then. But uh, does anyone in the audience have any final questions or does anyone on the panel have any final things they'd like to say? I'm not hearing any. So actually, as we're just keep on time, well done, everybody. Thank you very much. I'm going to thank you. It's been fantastic and really enjoyable. I would quite like to have chatted to you all evening. Um, so uh, maybe we can do that next time. Uh, so thank you all very much. Thank you for your time. And thank you for the really informative uh, information we've just got out of this. This is wonderful. So uh, I will see you all in the chat in a minute. Thank you. <laughs>